It's a pleasure to say that Alfred Eisigler is volunteering to start. Please. Thank you. Thank you, the organizers, for inviting me here. Today I'm not an organizer, but I'm just a lecturer, so let me make a quick advertisement for this event. Uh, there is a summer school. It will be a bit warmer than here because it will be in the summer in the Italy. Um, on modern aspects of dynamical systems, Cetraro in July. And you should apply, you will find it by Google, you should apply by the end of April, just in case you're interested in that. Um, group photo is at 10.30, just checked. So tomorrow at 10.30, we have the group photo, photo that will be around here. Um, yes, thank you. So I want to talk about effective dynamics, effective equidistribution, things like that. And it's sort of a mouthful. The, the whole thing that I want to explain is quite a lot. So I want to also go rapidly, but I don't want to lose you all at once. So I'll start with something more basic and move up to the ladder. So the, today I want to talk about um, sort of the whole spherical argument, and I want to explain that if you understand the whole spherical argument, whatever it is, we'll see, if you understand this whole spherical argument well, making it effective is not difficult. The input that you need to make it effective, that might be more difficult. But uh, that's that what I said. I want to explain a bit more carefully today. So the title might be effective in parentheses for spherical argument. for equidistribution, for measure classification, things like that. But let's set up the space. Um, what I'm interested in is, in this discussion right now, I'm interested in the hyperbolic plane. And so let's set up the language and the notation and recall what's going on there. So the hyperbolic plane is the set of all complex numbers where the imaginary part is positive, so that's the upper half plane model. That's my, my h here, all the points. And the real axis plus the point at infinity would be referred to as the boundary of the hyperbolic plane. And then one usually also wants to think of this not just as a set, but as a metric space, or as a Riemannian manifold. So you also need to have some kind of definition of what's the length of a tangent vector, or what's in a product. And inner product is basically the same in a product. The orthogonality of vectors is the same as usual, except that you sort of, if you're getting close to the boundary, you want to slow down the vector. You want to sort of say, oh, this is now way hard to go further down because the boundary is an infinite distance from any point in the hyperbolic plane. So the way to do this, and there's only one way to do it, is to somehow use dx squared plus dy squared over y squared, which means that if you have here some kind of path going through the hyperbolic plane and you want to know its hyperbolic length, you just integrate. Right, so this, let's say this is a path. What's the length of this path? You integrate from a to b, which is the domain of the path, and you take the standard derivative of the path, but then you divide by the imaginary part of the current position of the path and you integrate that, and that would be the length of the path. And once you have sort of this definition, lots and lots and lots of things are sort of forced on you. You can start asking, is there, are there sort of short paths from here to here on the hyperbolic plane? And the answer is, yeah, the shortest paths, the, the shortest paths, the straight lines, they sort of would be called geodesics, and the straight lines in this metric <coughs> then turn out to be um, half circles that have to intersect the boundary at a right angle. And yeah. lots of things are forced on you once you have sort of made this as your definition. The other thing that's amazing, 
that is that somehow even though it looks a bit artificial or something, it's just, okay, why, why would you look at this expression? This is the right expression because if you use this formula, there's a huge isometry group acting on the hyperbolic plane. And how does this come up? You just need to write down the formula and then check that it is an isometry. So if you take a matrix A, B, C, D in S of 2 R, and you take an uh, element of the upper half plane, then the matrix acts on this point <coughs> via Möbius transformation. And it's basically sort of matrix multiplication. You think of Z as Z index one, yeah. sub one. And then you do a matrix multiplication, except that you again normalize it. So it's, yeah. you haven't seen it. It's very natural, but it may take some getting used to. And the thing is that this acts, and it acts isometrically. So if you have to find this notion of length of paths and you do some very easy analysis one substitution, you see that when you compose the path with such a Möbius transformation, the length remains the same. By uh, and isometrically, that's important. Of course, it also acts smoothly, right? Because how can this not be smooth? It's just the ratio. So this action also extends, and the action extends to the tangent bundle of the hyperbolic plane, which I just define ad hoc as all the elements where the set is in the hyperbolic plane, and the vector has no constraint because the vector is sort of a, the current speed of a path at, that goes through z. So the vector has no constraints, but the z is constrained to be in the space. And I said already isometrically, and then there's another calculation. Those are fun calculations. They just would take sort of all of the lecture today to actually do it. So if you haven't seen them, do those calculations. They're really fun to do. Um, namely, it actually preserves the unit tangent bundle because of this isometric here. And preserves T1H consisting of all Z V in T H, where if I take the norm of the vector and divide by the imaginary part of Z, this is equal to 1. That's, that's sort of the regular 2 norm, the regular norm in the, here also, regular norm in the complex plane. And this is the modified norm, the, the, the manian norm of this tangent vector. And I want only those vectors that have length 1 in the hyperbolic sense. And because the action is isometric, a vector of hyperbolic length 1 would go to a vector of hyperbolic length 1, which is a very easy calculation. You don't need to integrate to do that. OK? Um, and extensively, on T1H, maybe you just, okay, it's a calculation. But let's try to understand it, how this happens. If you take a matrix of the form y to the 1 half, uh, y to the minus 1 half, and then another matrix here, 1x1, and you apply this to i. i belongs to h, right? We sort of think of this i as our origin. And if we do this, Möbius transformation twice. This here gives us yi. And this here just adds x to it, so we get x plus 
psi y, which is arbitrary, so we are transitive. And the second observation, so we are transitive on h. That's what this calculation did. But here I'm gaining more. I'm actually transitive on t1 of h. So I need to be able to somehow fix the vector i, but move the orientation of the ve vector around. And this is what SO2 one SO2 R does. If I have uh, an element of SO2 R, then there's a short calculation which I'm not doing. Then G acts on I to actually get I back if G is an orthogonal matrix. And the derivative is not the derivative of this action is not equal to the identity. So the Actually, what happens is that the vector at, at i, say, pointing north, will be rotated by SO2, will be rotated around at twice the speed of SO2. It's just some, any addition formula is needed, so it's not, not very deep. Concrete calculation reveals this fact. Okay. It's not um, simply transitive. But it's not simply transitive by a very small margin, because minus identity acts trivially, which is immediate from this formula here. If you have here minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1, you just have minus z over minus 1. So you get z back to so this acts trivially. So the upgrade of this transitivity up there is that PSO2R, which is SO2R mod the subgroup plus minus the identity modulo the center, acts simply transitivity. On the unit tangent bundle of the hyperbolic plane. Hence, you can make an identification. We can start to identify this with T1H using II as the starting point. Right? Or it is isomorphic to group mod stabilizer. If there's no stabilizer remaining, then you get an isomorphism because of transitivity, but you need a starting point. You need, you need to make a choice of the starting point, and let's just choose the vector pointing north at i as our starting point. Okay. Um, yes. Now, I want to use this identification in the remainder of all my lectures, I will just talk about the group and have geometric intuition about what's really going on. But my calculations I do in the group, it's much easier to multiply matrices than to all these two reverse transformations. Right, so that's somehow my background. I to motivate why we are looking at this group. Now, left multiplication. by G and ESL2R on ESL2R corresponds to the Möbius transformation. And our isometric If we equip the group itself with a left invariant remainder metric, which we want to do. Yeah. Using a left invariant metric. Okay. Um, but the group has somehow two sides. You can multiply on both sides. So you can ask, but what does it now mean to multiply on the right hand side? 
And this is way more interesting because this has now, in this context, automatically a geometric meaning. So right multiplication. by diagonal matrices, for instance. Corresponds to the geodesic flow. What do I mean by that? I drew it before somehow, but let's draw it again. I have here my upper half plane. I have a vector, I have a point. And now I said before that a vector and a point. No, I didn't say it like that. Now I say it like that. A vector and a point determines a direction that I want to follow. It determines a geodesic, a unique geodesic. So there's a unique circle touching the boundary at a normal angle, intersecting the boundary at a normal angle, going precisely for the point to precisely this direction, in the, precisely this direction. So, and the geodesic flow is doing the following. It's just saying, OK, you started with this z and this vector. And then after time t, you are here. So that's a geodesic flow at time t applied to z v. And if you want to make it, say it super complicatedly, there's actually a differential equation that sort of determines where you need to go after time t. Just in general context of Riemannian geometry, you can define geodesics, and it's about solving differential equations. Except that in our context, it's nothing but multiplying on the right by diagonal matrices, which is, of course, much easier to do. So let's not talk about the differential equation. That's just the multiplication on the right by diagonal matrices. OK. And then there's a second. Two other subgroups that are sort of important. Well, of course, we already saw SO2. When SO2 acts on the right, then what it does is it's just changing the orientation of the vector at every point, not just at i. When SO2 acts by Möbius transformation, then it fixes i and changes the orientation of the vector. But when SO2 acts on the right, it does the same thing that it does, does on, at i at every other point. So wherever you are, if you have some vector and SO2 acts on it, then SO2 does, does this. So SO2 fixes the, the whole plane. That's sort of part of this identification here. When you go go to H when you want to understand what's the, um, what H is isomorphic to. Well, it's the group mod the stabilizer of I, because we've said I is our origin. So H is PSO2 mod SO2. So when SO2 acts on the right, the point does not change, but the vector changes. So, yeah. so that's. SO2, that's one particular subgroup. That's the diagonal subgroup. Let's give it a name. Diagonal matrices in A. Capital A is sort of my name for the diagonal matrices. And then there are two more subgroups that are frequently useful, which is just the upper unipotent and lower unipotent, or upper triangular group, lower triangular group. You are not to interrupt, as was pointed out before. <laughs> I 
and then there's the, say, the upper unit voltage. Group U, Ux equals 1, x1, x and r. But when it acts on the unit tangent bundle, it parameterizes the stable manifold for the diagonal circle. Luckily, up there I didn't tell you the precise orientation of the diagonal subgroup. So I'm definitely correct here, right? Uh, <laughs> had I told you the thing, then I would have to think hard whether it's stable or unstable, but you can figure it out. Okay, um, how is that true? Why is this working? If you, if you can prove this statement for one point, you have proven it. Because if you have proven this statement for one point, then the left action will commute with the right action. Um, I should have emphasized here right action up. Um, acting on the right. The left action commutes with the right action if some statement like this is true for one point because of the transitivity of the left action it will be true for every point. So if you take the vector pointing north at i, and you look at its geodesic, it's just boring, just moving up. Now let's apply ux on the right to the vector pointing north. But the vector pointing north corresponds to the identity in the group. That was our choice. So we multiply the identity in the group on the right by the matrix. So we get the matrix. And then we let this matrix again act by Möbel's transformation to understand what vector it corresponds to in the hyperbolic plane. That's the isomorphism that I indicated up there. So if you take the vector pointing north, the unit and subgroup will act on it as Möbel's transformations. Then it will move this guy to another guy pointing north somewhere else on the right or left. Now if you have these two guys and you think about how their geodesics behave, their geodesics will be parallel, move up, will be parallel and stay the same distance. No, they will not stay in the same distance, they approach each other because of the hyperbolic metric. It looks as if they stay the same distance because we are thinking of Euclidean distance, but if you switch to hyperbolic distance and build in the over y in the whole expression, then you see that this is shorter than it's here. So it's true for one point, so it's true. And in the background, you could also just say this algebraically. Um, algebraically. This corresponds to <coughs> the calculation you take your matrix 1x1 then you take a diagonal matrix and now I have to think a little bit you conjugate the unipotent by the diagonal subgroup, then what you realize is that you get this unipotent back. But it will be the, the x parameter, the parameter that makes it not trivial, not the identity, this parameter will shrink when you conjugate it this way. And there's a choice of orientation, whether it's a plus or minus one here, and everything else is sort of determined if I fix this. And there's a choice of whether I look at upper or lower unipotence. And hence I can do this for stable manifolds or for unstable manifolds and both work and yeah. Good. 
So multiplying matrices, that's something that we get good at in, if you're working in this subject. Now, what are the dynamical properties of the geodesic flow or the, the whole cycle flow? This is called the whole cycle flow. And of course, there are two choices, but I've always, also always just call this the whole cycle flow. Uh, what are the dynamical properties when it acts on the hyperbolic plane? It's totally and utterly not interesting, totally boring. Right? Everything walks off to infinity, nothing interesting is happening. There's no recurrence, nothing. But that's, that would be the same if you do this in the hyperbolic plane, in the standard plane. If you take the standard plane and the vector point in this direction and we just go this way, there will be no recurrence. We never come back. But when one starts learning ergodic theory, the standard example would be you take the torus and take a vector in the direction and walk in this direction. And then you have something interesting to say. And you can start asking whether there are periodic points, depending on the direction, or whether there's negative distribution. Yes, of course there's negative distribution. So what we need to do is we need to fold up the space and make it sort of smaller because the, the whole plane is just way too big. It doesn't have finite volume, it's sort of infinite, right? And <coughs> there are many ways to fold up the hyperbolic plane. And I'm sure that this will also play a role in other courses this week. But I will just focus on one way, sort of the easiest way to fold up the hyperbolic plane. So we define the model surface. Um, the model surface is obtained from H1 by folding it using isometries, so Möbius transformations, left actions, um, using the isometries in SL2 set. That right? sort of seems natural that we try integers out because when we folded up the Euclidean plane, to become the torus, we also used integers. So this is a good attempt. And it is indeed a very nice space. You take the quotient of the hyperbolic plane by these isometries. <coughs> and, and you can take the quotient of the group or the unit tangent bundle by this discrete subgroup on the left. And you should think of this as the unit tangent bundle of this manifold. Now, of course, someone will tell me it's not a manifold, and then if someone tells me that, he can explain to everyone else that in the break, but let me just ignore that. <laughs> X is a manifold, so X is beautiful. No. M has two and a half year points. Okay. How does this look like? We want to understand how this looks like so that we get some feel for, for this quotient. And of course, I'm drawing n, but all the arguments will later actually happen in x. This is three dimensional manifolds are harder to draw than two dimensional ones. So that's a compromise we do. How does m look like? We need to look at Möbius transformations that sort of can fold up the space. One Möbius transformation that's definitely in SL2Z is this 1, 1, 0, 1 matrix. It will just translate by 1. So if we are looking for a fundamental domain and we want to don't have equivalent things that are equivalent for this map, we should look at the strip of distance 1. Because translation by 1 will be identified. And the standard thing is to look at minus one half to one half, why not? And just say, okay, 
Now I have this thing. That's already much smaller than the hyperbolic plane. But there's a second isometry that's took that together with, with this one will generate SL2Z. And that one has a different Möbius transformation. Namely, it has the Möbius transformation Z is mapped via this Möbius transformation to minus 1 over Z. That's some kind of inversion on the unit circle. So I should draw the unit circle and say everything outside is fine. Because if I'm inside, I can apply this map and get something outside. And OK, it's not a proof, but hopefully it's believable. And it's not too difficult to prove that this is now, this triangle here is now a fundamental domain. It's a triangle because all sides are geodesics, right? So. So this is identified to that via this transformation. And this side is identified to itself via this transformation. OK? Um, and now we can start asking, what does the geodesic flow look like when it acts on <coughs> x on the unit engine bundle of this surface? So geodesic flow. On x, let's give it a color. So we have a point, we have a vector, we follow that pointed vector, and it determines a geodesic in the hyperbolic plane, except that at some point it will walk out of our fundamental domain. But of course, this also happened in the torus. If we look at the torus example, and we just walk in a particular direction, at some point we walk out of the fundamental domain. But nobody's bothered by that. If you walk out, you just use an isometry to, and to get an equivalent different point so that now you walk in again. So if you hit this boundary, just say, OK, this point is equivalent to that point, and we keep going. And at some point, this circle will, will circle down and hit this boundary and sort of go into. And then this isometry will make that point equivalent to that point. And don't know. And anyway, you will walk up in which direction you try to figure it out. Homework. You need to calculate the derivative there. Um, OK, so that's the geodesic flow. How does the whole cycle flow look like? I didn't show you before how a whole cycle orbit in the hyperbolic plane looks like. But let's just fix that right now. So if this is your point and direction, then the geodesic sort of determines an endpoint. It has here a point that's sort of associated at the boundary. It's associated to this vector and direction, the point and direction. And the uh, homocycle orbit gives you a, a circle that's tangent to the boundary. And you just f follow the, this circle along so that the vector is always normal to that circle. And hence, will always, it will always point to the same boundary point at infinity. Maybe my picture doesn't show it particularly well, but that's what's happening. So the unipotent subgroup, the polycyclic subgroup that are similar up there, is sort of moving orthogonally to the geodesic flow. Geodesic flow will take this vector and move it this way. The polycyclic flow is moving it this way. OK, any questions about this picture so that we understand what we're talking about? Yes. So when it passes from one edge of the fundamental domain to the other, then we have to redraw that vector, find its new point of infinity, and then draw that other circle? Yes. So if you touch here this boundary point, then you would just shift the whole picture and make a minus one move. This point will be here, and this point would also shift precisely by one. And then you draw the boundary touching circle again, and you keep moving until you hit this which is a bit more complicated, I can't hold. 
Thank you. Yes? Can you please draw the horocycle flow not in the upper half of our uh, representation of the hyperbolic plane? But in this model? Yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. So there's a yeah, a Klein, you know, there's some name to this isomorphism, okay. which is a gather, another Katie. Katie. Katie, yes. Thank you. So there's a mother Möger's transformation, which is not defined by real matrices, but by complex matrices, which maps the upper half plane to the disk model. It's a Katie transformation, thank you. And then the geodesics, let's use the same color, the geodesics would again be circuits touching the boundary, hitting the boundary at the normal angle, and the horocycle orbits would be circuits touching the boundary. Because Möbius transformation is not only the real ones, but also the complex valued ones with complex matrix entries. They all preserve angles because they are complex differentiable maps, and they actually also map circuits and lines to circuits and lines. And if you know the statement somehow that we talked about in the hyperbolic plane, these statements are corollaries of the other ones. Thank you. Okay, so equidistribution. What do I want to equidistribute? Well, let's just say a few more things about the dynamics. Now the dynamics is interesting. So let's find out what things we could say. We are not proving maybe all of these things, but let's just get a feel for what is true when we look at this dynamical system now on this space X. Okay? Um, dynamics of X. You could start sort of with the big thing. The big group, PSL2R. PSL2R acts on the right on x, right? Because x is a quotient g mod gamma. Gamma is on the left. You can still act on the right by g. When you act by g on the right, you're transitive. So that's not particularly striking. But you can now ask whether some kind of transitivity would still be true if you go to subgroups. Of course, that's not true. That's sort of the Boltzmann hypothesis of Boltzmann formulated in a way that was totally wrong. But you can ask whether when you go to the subgroup, you're still ergodic. That's the correct way of saying it today. And that's true. So the diagonal subgroup, the geodesic flow, acts ergodically on X. Um, geodesic flow <coughs> equal diagonal subgroup. Acts ergodically <coughs> on X. Horocycle flow acts ergodically Yes? Keep us honest, maybe you should say a bit more about the measure. Yes. Um, <coughs> on the hyperbolic space. We sort of could use Riemannian geometry again to say dx dy over y squared is the nature of a body um, measure. It would be invariant under the Möbius transformation, it would be perfect. And then there's a circle attached somehow of the various rotations. So on the circle, you just use the back measure. Or if you don't want to build it up sort of in a pedestrian way, you just say this thing is a group, it's a nice group, a perfect group. The commutator of that group is back that group. Which means that there's a bi-invariant measure, bi-invariant harm measure of that group, because it's a nice group. And when you fold up the space, you need to take something like a fundamental domain, which, <coughs> which we discussed. You switch the measure to the fundamental domain and identify for the definition of the measure, you identify the fundamental domain with the quotient, and then you can push down the measure to the quotient. Which is what you would naturally also do on the torus, except that you would never say it so, so loud out because it's, it's so trivial on the torus. And if you get used to it, it's also trivial here. It's just you have some fundamental domain, you take a measure restricted to the fundamental domain, and think of the fundamental domain as your space. Now you have a measure on the space, and you can ask what properties it has. But thanks for the interruption, because I asked for it.
And now, the other thing that maybe I should point out, I said before that this space is smaller than the hyperbolic plane. It would be cool, it would be nice, it would simplify our life a bit if it were actually compact. That's not happening in this example. So it's somehow the most natural quotient of the hyperbolic plane where you just use integers to fold up the space. It gives you a quotient that's not compact, but has finite volume. And the finite volume mark is C because it's, as I said before, the volume is related to this density function. And if you integrate this over the fundamental domain, the y squared is fine. The dx is not a problem because the width is 1. And the dy you integrate them in from here up to infinity, but because of the over y squared, it's not an issue. Thank you. So now we have a probability measure. We are normalizing the measure to be a probability measure. You may not have to normalize it. Then you can ask what's the actual volume of this. And then there's gauss fournier formula, and it's a very nice geometry. But I just ignore all of that and say, I have a probability measure because I want to do a ergodic theory. And then I can do these things. I can say, geodesic flow is ergodic, homocycle flow is ergodic. And I can ask other questions. How about mixing? Everything is mixing. Um, even the big group, an SL2R acts, PSL2R acts mixingly. And then you can ask what's finer properties about the geodesic flow. Um, geodesic is hyperbolic. The geodesic flow is hyperbolic. Um, I don't want to define it, but somehow point out some consequences of this. Namely, there are lots of different orbit structures lots of invariant measures and lots is just something you couldn't possibly classify this there's just way too many things around that you could, you could hope you can't even hope to classify this ever it's just too wild lots of invariant measures While the whole cycle flow is completely different, the whole cycle flow is what we call rigid. And rigid means that the opposite. There are very few types of orbits. There are very few types of invariant measures. And very few in this case means two. There are only two types of orbits and only two types of invariant measures. And that's very different from lots, when you can't even hope to classify them ever in the future. Homocycle flow is rigid. Two types of orbits, two types, I should specify it a bit further to make it more correct, two types of ergodic invariant measures. That calls for a picture. If there are two types, then maybe I can draw the two types. So let me draw two, two times the modular surface. Now, here's one type. How measure? How measure is an ergodic invariant probability measure for the whole cycle flow. That's what I said up there, right? Whole cycle flow acts ergodically. Up there is sort of implicitly meant the Haar measure of the space, the uniform measure of the space, the three-dimensional measure of the space. And then there's a second type here, and that's 
very easy to draw. Periodic orbits for the whole cycle flow do happen on non compact portions. You take a vector pointing north. Let's just start with the vector pointing north at the identity, at the, vector, the original origin point. If you take this guy, then I said that the whole cycle flow moves horizontally and gives you this line of vectors pointing north. And if you hit the boundary, you have to use the isometry to go back on the other side, but that gives you the same object, right? So this closes up and becomes an, a one-dimensional torus sitting inside the three-dimensional space. And if you go sort of high up, this is a shorter periodic orbit, this is a longer periodic orbit. Right, so up here you get longer and longer ones, uh, shorter and shorter periodic orbits. There are also longer and longer periodic orbits around, namely down here. This is a longer periodic orbit. So this is shorter. This is my standard periodic orbit. And this is longer. And then, then you could ask things like, okay, I have this collection of periodic of ergodic measures. And what's actually their topology? What's the topology of, of the collection of invariant measures? I mean, obviously, if you just change the height a little bit, you will have two measures that are close by in the big star topology. So the, the height or the length, whatever you want to, how, whichever parameter you prefer, will be a, a parameter that sort of continues for the big star topology. But then the space of invariant measures is actually a compact space, right? But if you vary here the parameter and let the length go to infinity, and the, yeah, I'm contradicting myself now, but never mind that. Um, if you vary the parameter, you see maybe there's something more to say, be said about, and the, indeed, that's true. So in the topology of the, of the big star topology for measures, Or, or build the measures. The ergodic ones look like a line. That's this line here. But then there's a hole when when the periodic orbits get shorter and moving to infinity. And the hole is sort of the measure zero, because these things, when you move up and up and up, these measures converge to the zero measure in the big star topology. So there's a hole in the space of probability measures. And then you can ask what's happening on the other end. And the other end is precisely this. So the other end is filled. And when you move the periodic orbit sort of further down, nobody is worried about the periodic orbit being down here, so far away from the fundamental domain. Sort of expected the question, maybe by now everyone is asleep. <laughs> so when I draw a, fun, a periodic orbit down here, what could that possibly mean? It's one was there. Yeah, you have to use all sorts of isometries to try to push it into the fundamental domain. Why am I not doing this? Why am I not drawing it in here? Because of the statement that I'm trying to make, namely that these orbits will equidistribute. There will be a mess if I try to draw them in the fundamental domain. So I draw them outside and imagine <laughs> that you know that we should push them back into the fundamental domain using whatever isometries is necessary for various pieces. So. The minus 1 over z is sort of giving you a very small piece. So this small piece will actually land in the fundamental domain when you do the minus 1 over z. But then this guy will sort of walk out 
And then when it works out, you will have to do shifting and so on and all this discussion that we did before. You will have to do only finally many times because it will grow up eventually. And eventually is determined by the length, and the length you can calculate here. The length you would calculate in this picture, but you would have to sort of imagine it in the fundamental way. Anyway. But actually, I mean, this picture is one of the things that allow you to calculate the horse cycle flow. Is that the, the point of view down there is much easier to calculate? Yes, exactly. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about the theorem of Sana. Namely, the, the periodic orbits for the homocycle flow converge to Haar measure, to the Haar measure, normalized Haar measure. Uh, the normalized harm measure, I should say, normalized harm measure. This is the one dimensional harm measure on the periodic orbits for the horizontal flow converge to the normalized three dimensional harm measure. On X as the period. Their length increases to infinity. I will write down sort of what this means in, uh, yeah, just by definition. Big star topology, which may be star there, but let me write down what it actually means in terms of continuous test function and so on. And then I'll upgrade the statement. And that's also the theorem of Sanak because he did not apply the method that I want to explain. Find the non-convert quotients, Dani did the non-convert, okay, so and the method was quite uh, different. I so doesn't this already follow from Dani's And uh, No, not really. I mean, Dani and, uh, Dani and mm -hmm. Smiley had some paper that would give you that, too. But again, the method that I want to give you is easier than what they did. Okay, so what do I mean? Um, Ineffective claim. Oh, the claim is that there's no scale of mass here, actually. Also, yes. No, because otherwise it is. Ineffective claim for every f in CCX, we have I integrate from 0 to 1, my function gamma is PSL to Z. Then I have my U, US, and then I have already well, thought about whether it's minus one or, yeah, the, the signs I have to look up. The S, so that's a one dimensional integral. And this converges to the three dimensional integral over the whole space. S C goes to infinity. Or it might be minus infinity. But that's what I thought back then when I thought about it. So let's be consistent and think that this is the true statement. Um, I need to be careful, right? Because if I choose to sign correctly, I'm walking off to the zero measure, and then this will not be true. I think that's where you're going right now. <coughs> yeah. 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 
That's the statement. Um, as the length goes to infinity. And the length is determined. This is a point that still points northwards because this Möbius transformation will <coughs> map the vector pointing north to a vector pointing north. And then there's the unipotent that moves it horizontally around. And for one choice of sign, the length of this periodic orbit that I'm getting here goes to infinity. And then there's this game. This is the ineffective game, which is much easier to prove. One can easily do it in a master, master level course. With all the ingredients slower than this, maybe one can easily do it. And then there's the effective game. which is sort of the beginning of the story that I actually want to talk about. For every f in c, c infinity x, we have, instead of just saying there is convergence and you want to know how close it is, well, I don't tell you because I only tell you eventually it will be close, right? Here it's totally no information is being surveyed by how long do you actually have to wait? That's not discussed yet. It's just in the limit it's true. That's sort of typically what the Gothic field is very good at. In the limit it's true. But sort of making effective statements requires more structure of the functions and way more mathematics. So this proof, no matter how you do it, this proof is, is way harder than the other one. It uses way more structures, which is cool, but yeah. So instead of saying something happens in the limit, I write down the same integral. Yeah, and then I half believe, more than half believe Leo. So let's change the sign. So I'm comparing that expression, that the uh, integral of a one-dimensional periodic orbit, I'm directly comparing it to the integral over the whole space. I get some implicit constant that someone could figure out, but it's not my focus. The point is that it's absolute. It only depends on the surface that I'm studying. And then there's an e to the minus kappa t, some very good error rate, and some measure of the smoothness of the function. So the, the function is assumed to be smooth. Here I'm using some Sobolev norm. So a bit more analysis enters. Um, Sobolev norm means a certain number of derivatives is important. And here it's only one derivative that I need. I need to know that if I'm sort of moving a small step in the space, then the function changes by a small amount. So um, mean value theorem from analysis one used in this manifold. So I want the bound. This includes a bound of the derivatives. An infinity norm bound of the derivative. Manfred? Yes. Which direction of is there a directional derivative? Um, you use all of them. So three, you use three of them and you take the max and then there's an absolute constant that you didn't really care about. So and you really which three? All, all the um, yes, because you need the derivatives sort of in different ways, in different parts of the argument. And I, I, I'm too lazy to figure out whether you really need all three of the directions, but I believe you do. So the diagonal subgroup will enter anyway at some, uh, no, not the diagonal, the orthogonal subgroup enters in all of the discussions anyway. So if you don't have the derivative along the orthogonal subgroup, you're probably doomed and can't say anything. And then the unit model is the direction that we care about. So there you don't need a derivative. But transversely to the unit along the diagonal and the opposite unit model, you need a derivative. And that means three directions, right? And Three directions kind of is everything. So 
and I'm pretty sure that he made all three. And then in which order you'd use them or so that would just help you to optimize the constant and would not, not make any difference in the exponent. Maybe you can just use the Cassini operator, which also includes the three of them, and define the sobolet norm. It's a higher derivative of Cassini. You can use lots and lots and lots of harmonic analysis that I don't want to talk about. Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, right, so my plan for today was, you know, for this lecture was, to, to actually prove this completely and, and to give you an idea that the proof of that is the same as the proof of that if you know effective mixing. But I guess it's the plan for the day now and not for this lecture. Good. Thank you. Questions? More? Effective questions? Yes? Just a, just a notational thing, terminological thing. Rigid doesn't mean rigid, right? I mean, it, it, so... So it there's a notion of rigid in rigid. ergodic theory that so I have studied carefully, and yes. that's different. Yes. So, if you so it's rigid in the sense of it's hard to perturb the thing yeah. and get some really different picture, yeah. which is true in the for the geodesic flow. Mm -hmm. You can perturb orbits and it will be orbits. It will be very close to orbits. So geodesic flow is sort of, it's very soft in the following sense. Okay, there's this guy that walks on the surface along the geodesic up to here. Then it needs a friend who is sort of not quite at the same place. And for a while that it goes together, but the friend then goes to a different place. Then there's actually an orbit that starts here and follows precisely the first guy up to the meeting point, then the first guy walks off, and the, the third guy that exists now keeps walking the same path as the second guy. So whenever two orbits meet somewhere, there's a way to switch from the one to the other. That's very soft. And using this, that's sort of a loss of uh, closing, shadowing, shadowing. This is a loss of shadowing, and there's also a loss of closing thing, and it's, it's very soft. You can do lots of constructions. Not, none of this is true for the whole cycle flow, because there are only two types of orbits. So that's sort of total, total opposite of softness, and people call it rigid. Thank you. Um, yes? What about this uh, kappa? You can try to optimize this kappa. Of course, the, the sana would give you a better kappa than, than I would give you by the argument that I want to explain. And if you get the optimal kappa, it's a million. Because the optimal kappa is the Riemann hypothesis. So it means that you probably don't get the optimal. Ah, no, no, you're right. Yeah, I'm wrong. That's not a spectrum then? Um, let me see. What you get is that maybe the wrong the cellular conjecture or something. No, I think that's right. Go to set. Because it's right. Yeah. All right. And no, it's not the, the spectral gap. Would give you something, but it doesn't give you the correct thing. The correct thing is much is conjectured to be much better, and the correct thing. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yes. Which is not what I'm going to tell. It will be, I guess, Lindelof, right? Okay. Let's thank Manfred for for the moment again.